final month or so as Prime Minister, it's tradition for departing PMs to create new life peerages as resignation, in a resignation honours list. Now, reports from the Times newspaper suggest that Boris Johnson could appoint dozens of new peers to the second largest uh, chamber in the world. That, of course, second only in size to the uh, People's Republic of China legislative assembly, of course. Now, I've still got Dr Richard Johnson with me here in the studio. And you have some interesting thoughts about the size of the House of Lords. The House of Lords is an enormous chamber, but potentially it behaves differently to other chambers around the world. And, and could you talk to that, how potentially the size of the Lords might not be this big issue that we should all get so hung up about? I'm going to say something controversial. It's GB News. Why not? I think the House of Lords could be a lot bigger. It used to be over uh, 1,300 members in the 1990s. Tony Blair took out uh, about 600 mostly conservative hereditary peers in his reform. He then appointed uh, over 370 more mostly Labour peers to the House of Lords. So there's been a lot of reshaping of the House of Lords. Mm. The House of Lords, as you said, isn't like other legislative chambers. We shouldn't see it like other legislative chambers. We should see it more as a pool of a mix of experts and experienced politicians who can intervene on particular debates on areas that they have something important, interesting, or relevant to say. But we shouldn't expect peers to behave like MPs. You know, the, the, in terms of daily attendance, the House of the, there are fewer lords who go and participate than MPs. Mm. So it functionally, the House of Lords is actually smaller than the Commons in terms of who's there on a given day. Mm. And that's fine. We, 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 sometimes we might want Lord Robert Winston to come in and, and, and speak about some matter of uh, embryology. Or the late Lord Trimble, a Nobel Prize winner. Do, we don't necessarily need him to speak on every matter, but when it comes to something to do with Northern Ireland in particular, mm. we might want someone of his calibre there in the wings ready to come in. And that's what I think is you know, missing from this discussion. We, just, we don't want a replicate House of Commons. Mm. You don't want everyone to cram in all the time and vote on every issue. Although, looking at the numbers there, the Conservative Party, of course, does not have a majority, nothing close to it in the House of Lords. Let's have a look at some of these appointments since 1997. We have the numbers uh, for everyone here. Uh, Blair appointed 374 peers. Uh, Gordon Brown appointed 34. Cameron appointed 245, of course, a lot of those being Liberal Democrats when the coalition came in as well. May appointed 43. And up until the 31st of January 2020, Boris Johnson appointed 21. So that's 717 new peers since 1997, a pretty large number. But what is the likelihood that Boris Johnson will institute a sort of Blair-style injection to almost rebalance the Lords, which has a, a Labour Lib Dem supermajority as things stand, can Boris get away with injecting a lot of new Conservative peers to help win those votes in the Lords? Yeah, I, I think we don't want to see the Lords in terms of trying to get as close to each election, uh, you know, in terms of its composition, because that is a way in which there's kind of, there is a, an expansion that probably would just keep going on and on. But prime ministers, I think, are entitled to ensure that certain voices are heard in the Lords. And, you know, if the prime minister feels that some voices aren't being heard at the moment but have some interesting contributions to make, then the prime minister should feel entitled to do that. It has always been a bit of a scandal after, with resignation honours. The most probably infamous was Harold Wilson with his lavender list when he resigned and he, he put his personal doctor in the House of Lords, for example, <laughs> uh, and he gave um, an honour to his housekeeper. You know, mm. so the, you know, this is something that goes goes way back. It's not the most kind of uh, beautiful element of the British system, but I think that the the flexibility that prime ministers have is a price worth paying to ensure that actually the House of Lords has something different and interesting to say, but can't challenge the primacy of the House of Commons, which I think is an extremely important democratic principle. There's a paradox here that the, the kind of undemocratic composition of the House of Lords preserves the democratic principle of the primacy of the House of Commons. Mm. And, and I think that that's something that also gets missed in this discussion. If you make the House of Lords more professionalised, more regularised, then it will start to claim some kind of legitimacy mm. contra the House of Commons. And rather than seeing the House of Lords eventually 
give way to the will of the House of Commons, the House of Lords might become more insistent than blocking the House of Commons. And this, this is the Tony Benn argument, why he never in, was in favour of Lords reform. He was in favour of Lords abolition, uh, because he didn't want that challenge to the democratic mandate. Dr Richard Johnson, it has been a fascinating discussion. Thank you so much for being here in the studio with us to talk through those very important issues. No doubt we'll be hearing more about the Lords and all the rigmarole around that as time goes on. Well, now to our next story today. Thousands of